Oh, starting the slides. Okay. See, I'm so bad at this. All right. Everybody can see, is the thing up there, the PowerPoint, hopefully. Okay, great. Yeah. All right. Never quite know. Okay. Thank you for coming. I, I really appreciate this. And uh, Elvira, it's nice to see you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to be talking today about Gothic Chapbooks, Blue Books, and Chilling Shockers. It's, it's a, been a passion of mine for the last oh, 10, 12, 15 years. Just uh, become obsessed with them. And there hasn't been any good studies, full length studies on them. So I uh, have just finished uh, my book it's by the same name. And it's coming out in January from the University of Wales Press. So if you're interested, a lot of the information is there and more in it. It's, it's a kind of an overview of the Gothic chapbook industry and what happens. I was intrigued about this topic because of the early literary historians outright dismissal and, and um, marginalization of Gothic chapbooks. Everyone from uh, um, Montague Summers up to Fred Franks, Frank has, has really kind of made fun of and pushed aside the Gothic chapbook as this aberration of, of, of the Gothic and its, uh, its bastard child. And I think that's an unfair way to look at it. And I think if we do want to look at Gothic studies and, um, and get a good idea about it, we need to look at all aspects of the Gothic and the chapbook was certainly one of them. So um, let me try to figure out, okay. All right, so I have broken it down into five sections and yeah, we'll, we'll see how they work out. Uh, I, I'll stop though occasionally and if you have a question, please just let me know. I'm, I'm more than happy to answer it. All right, so we're gonna start off with the origins of the chap books because um, according to, well, according to Fred Frank and, and, and others, the Gothic chap books were nothing but outright plagiarisms and um, abridgments and extractions from Gothic novels. And I was intrigued by that and, and found that as a good starting point because I really wanted to know, you know, what was the first Gothic chapbook? Why did somebody put that out? What was it? What uh, was their influence? Who was their audience? Is it the same as a, a Gothic novel reader? It was the, was it the publisher who was following the reader's predilections or the other way around it. So these kind of questions kind of intrigued me and got me asking where they came from at first. So the early predecessors of the Gothic chapbooks were of course uh, directly related to the prominence and pervasiveness of Gothic tales found in popular magazines at the time. On the whole, there are two types of Gothic short tales, uh, Gothic short stories, tales and fragments. Each type contains an abbreviated form of the Gothic, including conventional motifs and characteristics. There is no difference between the two terms, um, except that in length, the tale being longer of the two, obviously. Consequently, the term Gothic tale applies equally to short stories, tales of terror, novelettes, fragments, booklets, um, even up to serialized romances. Larger serialized romances, of course, became, eventually became novels like Graysville, uh, George Moore's Graysville Abbey, but there was a lot of shorter serialized uh, novels that appeared in these magazines. And they uh, are very interesting to, to study and to look at because they are attracted to a different sort of reader. These magazines were directed specifically at a certain type. So the ladies magazine, Universal, Mag uh, Universal Magazine, the New Gleaner, they all had their devoted readers who their, the editors knew what kind of stories they would like and what they wanted. So the ladies magazine, of course, had a huge following and they actually did publish uh, quite a number of Gothic tales and serialized several Gothic novels. And Universal Magazine also uh, did a very good job of spreading the Gothic tale throughout their uh, issues and over the years. The, another thing that was popular within these magazines were the abridgments of, of these novels. And they were popular because they 
you know, could be redacted and they were short. So the first one that appeared was Horace Walpole's Castle of Otranto, which appeared in 1765 in the Universal Magazine of Knowledge and, uh, and Pleasure, and again in the New Wonderful Magazine in 1794. Clara Reeves' Old English Baron, uh, for example, was serialized in the Berwick Museum of the Monthly Literary Intelligencer in 1793, the same year that George Moore's um, Graysville Abbey started to run in the ladies' magazine. We can also find examples of extracts from The Monk in The Monthly Mirror and uh, Radcliffe's The Italian. If you look at the reviews by Coleridge of Radcliffe's works, large sections are extracted and discussed. And this has a lot to do with the idea of copyrighted abridgment at that period. So the amount of abridgments and distractions, particularly of Gothic tales is worth considering because critics of a Gothic chapbook often point to the, these abridgments as the evidence of the corruption of the Gothic novel. Oh, boo-hoo, it's, you know, the, the, what killed the Gothic novel are these, these soddy little abridgments of these wonderful novels. Well, yes and no. They, they sure, they didn't help it all the time, but um, it was, it was done for a reason because, um, well, in 1710, the Statute of Anne passed, which allowed for the first time publishers and booksellers to be protected, uh, to protect their books, their material. 21 years for old, uh, for old books and 28 years for newly published books. And this was, quote, for the securing of property uh, of copies of books to the rightful owners thereof. And quote, while the Act of 1710 prohibited pirating and reprinting books in their, entirety, in their entirety, it was ambiguous about abridgments. It wasn't until 1741, the Giles v. Wilcox, that Lord Chancellor Hardwick argued that shortened books were, quote, a mere evasion of the statute and cannot be called an abridgment, close quote. Instead, he reasoned that the statute was, quote, not to be carried so far as to restrain persons from making a real and fair abridgment, for it, abridgments may with great propriety be called a new book, because not only the paper and print, but the invention, learning, and judgment of the author is shown in them, and in many cases are extremely useful. Uh, so they were starting, they were tending towards that direction of allowing abridgments if it would be beneficial for others. Uh, the statute was further clarified by Stratton v. Newberry in 1774, where Lord Chancellor Aspley, Aspley uh, likewise argued that, quote, the act of abridgment is an act of understanding employed in carrying large works into small compass and rendering it less expensive and more convenient both to the time and use of the reader. It was because of this assertion that periodicals readily use the right to abridge and print ex from literary works, notwithstanding their copyrights. But after 1774, we had a flood of these abridgments because they could, because they, they served a purpose. They allowed access uh, to works of fiction that could not otherwise be obtained by readers of magazines or the working class. So we had this flood. They were actually allowed to extract between 500 and 20,000 words straight up. So we do see why we have some of these claims that these were straight up abridgments and extractions because yeah, of course they were. They did want to harvest these novels to uh, provide things for other people, for other readers. Now, I'm sorry there. Okay. From these peri popular periodicals come the earliest example of what can be called the Gothic chapbook. The first was a small pamphlet consisting of 28 pages, which was selected by publisher George Nicholson. And he took three well-known tales that were appearing in the magazines all over different magazines throughout the country. Uh, Sir Bertrand, which of course everyone knows. Um, Sir Gawain, which appeared in The Spectre. This was written by Nathan Drake. And Edwin, which was a popular uh, short tale that appeared first in the Universal Magazine. And these, th this, this pamphlet highlighted the, the opportunity that publishers now saw to gather these extracts and these short stories into something that they could market to other readers. Readers who did not have access to 
the magazines um, because even magazines cost money and they have, often had them in uh, circulating libraries where people couldn't, a lot of people had trouble getting access to. So some of the publishers who, who um, turned their direction, turned their attention to these types of books um, were already producing chapbooks and pamphlets throughout, you know, of, of, of different types and different subjects, anywhere from cooking books to uh, fishing books, works of fiction. Robinson Crusoe was, was redacted, abridged, and plagiarized dozens of times in, in the issue. It allowed people to have access to books and works that they never had access to before. Which leads us to a better to a to a question that we always have. This happens at the end of the this is happening at the end of the nineteenth century. So the Gothic novel has been in play for for up to thirty years or so, and they're now finding themselves uh, on the cusp of a new audience. Somebody, uh, people who normally could not afford the cost of a book, but perhaps can afford a chapbook. And so we start to see this. Uh, the, these short gothic tales come out more and more often. And we have the tendency to call these things chapbooks. And chapbooks, of course, are different than gothic chapbooks. And this is kind of, I'll just quickly go over some definitions because it is important that we, how we look at these things and define them. Chapbooks are small books, cheaply sold, cut, uh, sold uncut by itinerant peddlers throughout the country. They offer traditional ballads, short stories, older novels, lots of the Robinson Crusoe and fairy tales, uh, Goody Two Shoes, Jack and the Beanstalk. These sorts of things appeared in these chapbooks. They were small. They were often um, included a wood cutting, like the Sir James the Rose there. And they were very made on cheap material but they were accessible. So you can often find, I think I just saw a program somewhere um, a year or two ago, but somebody was re, uh, doing a renovation uh, in England and they were doing the chimney and they found a stash of chapbooks that the person had collected and they had put their name in there and, and gathered them up and it was this person's private collection that eventually got forgotten about, but they were something that they, people, hung on to and, and, and treasured. But what happens at the end of the 19th century is that uh, Chapman were disappearing, the traditional chapbooks were continuing but declining, and a higher quality chapbook came in and started to appear, often referred to as the blue book, uh, designated by their fancy blue cover and their uh, flashy advertising there. Uh, Harry Weiss observed that, quote, there appeared chapbooks of a somewhat better kind selling for a sixpence and a shilling, specifically small books that targeted the growing readership who had access to both money and libraries. So these blue books were designed not for the poorest people, but for the working poor and the lower middle class who had a little bit of money, who had access to libraries. The shift to a better chapbook is only dis, uh, one discernibly different from the usual ephemera and street literature by some publishers was just one way they sought to uh, satisfy this increasing demand for literature. Montague Summers declared that gothic blue books like chapbooks were quote, read and read on every side by schoolboys, by apprentices, by servant girls, and by a whole of what vast populations which belong to be in fashion to steep themselves in the Gothic romance. And he's correct in this sense, it was read by everybody. These were designed not just for the lower classes, it was designed for anyone who wanted to have access to these tales. And we'll talk a little more about what's, how they did that uh, another, another term we see a lot is the shilling shocker. And this was coined by William Watt in what was the first study of, full length study of Gothic chapbooks. It was, it's a great little read if you find it. It's, it's about the size of a chapbook. It's like 57 pages. And he gives a lot of basic information that gives us a lot of, uh, gives us a good starting point of where we can go with it. 
But he, his argument for this new fancy term was, in so much as the word blue book carries varying connotations to the English parliamentarian, the law, uh, American social lion, and the American college students, it seems appropriate for our purposes to use a more horrid term, the shilling chalker. And it's true. I mean, it is fun to, to consider these as shockers, because if you look at the illustration here from Wolfstein, they are over the top and they are sensational. And they offer, you know, the, the best of a Gothic novel crammed into a short, into a small space. And so they are really sensational and they are shockers. Uh, we also get the term blue book from, of course, Thomas Medwin, as he described uh, Percy Shelley's predilection for blue books uh, for short tales of terror. And no doubt he would also find the term shilling shocker relatable. But I think the best term to call these things are pamphlets, because this is what they were. They focused more on contemporary fiction, and they contained exactly what I said, extracts from the magazines, and allowed people to, uh, to, to new material rather than just the old material. And they were printed on higher end paper. They used uh, better printing process, better illustrations. Um, and if we want to you know, set aside the term chapbook, the, chap for, the term itself wasn't coined until 1824. So the contemporary readers of these pamphlets would not have recognized them as a Gothic chapbook, perhaps as a pamphlet. And one last point of distinction for the pamphlet is one of markability, commercial interest, and accessibility. Despite the warning issued in the use of a circulating library considered in 1797, uh, which said that pamphlets in general are very properly excluded from the shelves of circulating libraries. They are literary mushrooms, which only enjoy a precarious existence, therefore cannot afford a lasting source of either instruction or amusement. Large and small circulating libraries across the country, though commonly included a pamphlet section. And it usually was stocked with political and religious tracts, but uh, as well as biographies, the, the probably most popular one was the uh, uh, the death of, of Horatio Nelson. Uh, that was everywhere. There were dozens of, of versions of his of his death that were available in the pamphlet section. Voyages were very popular, but they also contained wonderful Gothic stories like Kilverstone Castle, The Air Restored, Raymond and Agnes, uh, A Romance with a Wandering Spirit. So contemporary readers would have found these pamphlets um, that they provided something new and different. So whenever I talk about it, I'm going to use the terms pamphlet and chap, uh, pamphlet and chapbook uh, interchangeably. They just are really the one in the same. Uh, and again, like I said, perhaps it was a confusion of these different designations and attempts to marginalize them that has left the Gothic chapbook really unexplored. We've looked at some of them and a lot of scholars have done some great work on introducing our, us into them, but there's really been no study on these, these, uh, these short tales of terror. Uh, who produced them? Who read them? Who wrote them? How were they uh, distributed? Were they advertised? How do they compare to the Gothic novel? And so what I've done is I've compiled a, a bibliography of 400 chapbooks. Unfortunately, I sent it off to the publisher with 400 chapbooks, but now I've found probably 25 or 35 more uh, examples. But I did this study because we want to be able to look at the publication and the production of these, these pamphlets across the, time, uh, across the period from 1797 to, 17, uh, to 1828 and see what the trends were and to find out more information. And I'm sorry, this is perhaps dull for people, but I love this kind of stuff. So this is a graph of the uh, the number of Gothic pamphlets published between 1797 to about 1828. And it's very revealing, I think. The one thing I really liked about Fred Frank's 
discussion about the chaplets besides his, his denigration of them was that he always thought that there were hundreds if not thousands of these things around. And so I was really hoping that would be the case, but I was lucky to find, you know, 425, 435 of them. I would say there's probably maybe between five, around 500 would be a, a better estimate. But this gives us an idea of when they appeared and how popular they, they could have been. Because remember, the publishers are, write, are publishing these things because of reader interests, and they're capitalizing on the interest in the Gothic novel. So another, this is just breaking down these figures to a little 1797 to 1810. So again, we see that between 1802 and 1807, is, there's a tremendous interest in, the, in these sorts of, of books. And let me see, I have some interest. Okay, so let's see, uh, sorry. Okay, so we see the largest numbers, of course, happening between 1802 and 1807, and this is because of a certain reason, and that is the publication of the Telltale Magazine by Anne Lemoyne, the Popular Tales Collection by Anne Lemoyne, and the Marvelous Magazine. And this was just an intense period of publications, and so uh, it gives us a great indication, but after that, it kind of just goes along plods along, there's, some, there's still obviously continued interest, just like the Gothic. The Gothic novel at this time is continuing to decline as well. And in 1825, though, we see this large intake of, an uptick of, of publications due to J. Mark's uh, Endless Entertainment, which was a collection of weekly Gothic chapbooks that he uh, bound individually and and had subscribers too, and he put out about eight of these each week, and then he just finished it up by putting another, uh, another eight in there, and publishing it as one volume. So they were available both as individual chapbooks and as the collection, and that was in 1825. So still some continued interest. Uh, a more interesting graph though is this one that shows the Gothic novel versus the pamphlet. And I got these, the numbers from the Gothic novel, uh, which I think have been better verified now by Peter Garside. He uh, contributed to the English novel, 1770 to 1829, a bibliographical survey of prose fiction published in the British Isles. And that gave us an indication of all of the books that were really published, physical copies found. And then he cataloged what was uh, a Gothic novel. So I've compared that to the production of the Gothic chapbooks. And this is interesting because we see, for the most part, it follows the popularity. Except between 1802 and 1805 when the Gothic novel production dropped. So uh, for example, in the beginning of the 19th century, Gothic chapbooks were still relatively rare with eight copy, uh, eight new titles in 1800 compared to 27 Gothic novels. The number of novels, though, decreased in 1821, uh, in 1801 to 20, and eight chapbooks were produced uh, by different publishers. But it shows this interesting jump in production from Gothic chapbooks um, from 41 pamphlets compared to 19 novels in 1803. And in 1804, the disparity increased with only 10 novels appearing compared to 35 pamphlets. During this remarkable period of 1802 to 1805, 134 pamphlets were published compared to 73 Gothic novels. Despite the significant variance, there's a clear correlation though between the two. So we see it all the way again in 1825, though we have the spike and we have this drop off in, um, and the Gothic, there was only one Gothic novel that was produced that year with 12 chapbooks. So it also, my study also shows how, uh, how many publishers were involved in this endeavor. Um, and it also sh illustrates the fact that these were not, it, they were not well connected to each other in large parts. In some aspects, they were connected, but in large parts, they each knew that their audience or their readers would appreciate a Gothic chapbook. 
and produce that, though there was some concerted effort together. Um, the, this figure illustrates that 42 publishers produced Gothic pamphlets, but only five uh, stand out in terms of numbers. Anne Lemoyne, along with her um, collaborator, John Rowe, Thomas Tegg, John Bailey, Thomas Hughes, and Dean and Monday. The publishers, uh, Anne Lemoyne and John Rowe, this, uh, astonishingly produced 99 of the 400 chapbooks. A, a full quarter of the chapbooks were uh, published by Anne Lemoyne. Uh, followed by Thomas Tegg, who published 37 titles, or roughly 9%. Followed by John Bailey, who published 38 uh, titles, again 9%. But it's interesting that Tegg was only active for three, uh, three or four years. He was active from 1802 to 1805, then again in 1810. That's all. So he was, you know, there, there was these basically four years where he was active, but he produced you know, 37 of these chapbooks during that period. At least 11, uh, I'm sorry, the combination of, of Thomas Hughes, um, John Bailey and Dean and Monday though, account for uh, 233 or 58% of all of the chapbooks. So these, these publishers worked kind of not together, but they were producing at the same time with these large numbers. At least 11 publishers issued seven or more titles, including publisher Simon Fisher, who was responsible for the honestly, honestly God, first Gothic uh, pamphlet, releasing some 17 titles between 1798 and 1823. Uh, the remaining 26 publishers issued a combined 42 pamphlets with 19 firms only releasing one title each. The study, as we see, demonstrates that while the Gothic market was active, it was driven by a small number of publishers who invested their resources targeting specific readers who prefer sensational Gothic literature. So we're going to look a, uh, a lot more at those particular publishers because they give us a lot of information. But one last graph, and then it's mostly over. Um, Again, going back to Fred Frank's Montague Summers, their argument of, against the Gothic chapbook was that they were blatant plagiarisms, pirating of Gothic novels. Well, that's just not true. Um, this slide reflects that 120 or 30% of the 400 titles in this survey were adaptations. 83 of those were based on novels or ballads and 37 on dramas. Virtually all publishers issued adaptations of one genre or another. 24 firms in the study published at least one adaptation of a novel or drama. For four of these firms, it was their only Gothic pamphlet. Anne Lemoyne published the most adaptations with 26, 15 novels and 11 dramas, which all primarily appeared in the Telltale Magazine and in her other collection, The Popular Lives, uh, Tales, Lives and Adventures. Dean and Monday issued a total of 14 adaptations, 10 novels and four dramas, and Tag 13 with uh, 13 novels and one drama. John Bailey published 11 with uh, doing, uh, adapting eight novels and three dramas. Uh, surprisingly, well, it surprised me, uh, the most adapted or bridged author was Sir Walter Scott. I really would have thought it was Matthew Lewis, Anne Radcliffe, even Eliza Parsons. She has several things, but it was really Sir Walter Scott who had the most. Eleven novels were adapted into fourteen, at least fourteen pamphlets, and I know there's others that I still need to find. Dean and Monday, for example, issued seven. John Bailey issued five, and publisher William Mason issued two. The most popular novels by Scott. Um, being Ivanhoe, which was abridged by was John Bailey as Ivanhoe or the Knight Templar and the Jew's Daughter, and William Mason as Ivanhoe, the Jew and his daughter. So that we get these slight twists in title to differentiate them from the others. Dina Monday also published the, uh, the Pirate, re retitled The Pirate, The Sisters of, West, of Burrow West, 
And it was epitomized, even this is in the title, epitomized by Sarah Wilkinson in 1822. So a lot of the authors who did adapt these novels and dramas were very clear about where the source was and that they were epitomizing, translating, abridging, anything like that to include the, the source. There were others who, who would slap on the term original tale to, you know, to the plot of, of Mysteries of Udolpho and they had no, no problem with that. For the most part, authors generally gave credit to those. The most frequently text though that was adapted uh, was The Monk which appeared in at least five different versions. Father Innocent, the Abbot of the Capuchins, uh, Fatal Vows of the False Monk. For Tag, he published the Castle of Lindenburg um, that was actually penned by Wilkinson. Uh, John Bailey did the Castle of Lindenburg with the history of Raymond and Agnes. And uh, William Mason, his, his chapbook is simply The Monk and it includes the entire summary of the book on the cover. It's, it's a straight up, just if you want to read the, chat, the, uh, the Monk and don't have the time for three volumes, pick up this and you can be just fine. Other popular novels that were abridged were Eliza Parsons, Mysterious Warning, um, and Clara Reeves, The Old English Baron. So that kind of gives a, a, a little overview of initially the first part of the of the rise of the of the chapter. I wanted to give you the information about the the numbers because I'm not gonna be able to discuss them all and but it gives us an idea about where the uh, publications are going. Are there any questions? So I'll start with this wonderful little quote from, from Coleridge when he's talking about the monk. The horrible and the preternatural have usually seized the, on the popular taste at the rise and the decline of literature. And I think that's fitting because, you know, a lot of people do see the, <laughs> the rise and decline of the Gothic within the monk and, and in the reaction. But it also underscores this great interest in the horrible and the preternatural that um, the Gothic Champ book capitalized on. The, and this all started with the publication of The Monk on March 12th, 1796. It was popular as everyone knows and a second edition appeared in October of the same year where Mont uh, Lewis decided to claim authorship and cause a, a scandal and it, uh, I, I can't underscore enough how much of a scandal this caused and how this probably excited the booksellers. Um, for critics of Lewis's role as an MP, uh, people were just astonished and disturbed. And his, one of his biographers, William Todd, observed that, quote, the news sent every mouth agape. Here to the horror of all was the spectacle of a man elected to office that he might preserve morality in the realm and acknowledging as his a work apparently designed to corrupt all morals, end quote. Indeed, as the indignation deepened, the public became more curious. And this is, uh, uh, here's a, a little example of the interest that the general public took. Montague Summers in the Gothic Quests uh, tells a story about this um, circulating library proprietor. It says, when Monk Lewis's sensational, uh, sensational romance was in universal request, a Mrs. Lord, who kept a li uh, circulating library in Dublin, enriched it with sufficient copies for her customers, young and old. A highly correct paterfamilias, having reproved her for imperiling the morality of the, metropoli uh, the metro metropolis by admitting such a book into her catalog, she naively replied, quote, a shocking bad book to be sh sure, sir, but I have carefully looked through every copy and underscored all the naughty passages and cautioned my young ladies what they are to skip without reading. And I think this is just a wonderful example of, you know, highlighting, you know, it, Anyone knows if you're going to highlight a, a passage in a book that you're going to read it. And, you know, poor Mrs. Laura thought she was doing this great thing by pointing it out, but it just made the hubbub around it even more. Uh, in fact, in April of 1797, oops, sorry, uh, it continued 
to, to increase the popularity. And uh, Joseph Bell, his publisher, announced the third edition. And at the same time, grief, at the same time, there was a grand ballet staged at Covent Garden titled Raymond and Agnes, the Castle of Lindenburg. And it is a ballet based on the Bleeding Nun. And it was very successful. It ran uh, every night from March 16th to June 1st. And so people in London were talking about this. People in the provinces were talking about this. It was causing a scandal. But one thing finally pushed it over the edge for uh, Lewis's critics and for the leadership in the country. Uh, and this was the fourth dialogue of Thomas James Matthias's Pursuits of Literature was published. This long poem where he would critique modern literature coming out. And he challenged Lewis as, as an MP in what he's doing. And he wrote, quote, a, legislature, a legislator in our own parliament, a member of the House of Commons of Great Britain, an elected guardian and defender of the laws, the religion, and the good manners of the country, has neither scrupled nor blushed to depict and to publish to the world the arts of lewd and systematic seduction, and to thrust upon the nation the most open and unqualified blasphemy against the very code and volume of our religion. End quote. And then he concluded with this great line, um, quote, religion is part of our common law and therefore whatever is an offense against that is an offense against common law. Close quote. His forthright condemnation and public accusations of immorality about the monk really caused public officials to finally sit up and take notice. In so much that, the, that, that Todd notes that there was this backlash and the contemporary references indicate, quote, that both Lewis and Bell, his publisher, were indicted by the court of King's Bench, probably at the instigation of the Proclamation Society. And a decree was set against them that they, the publisher had to recall all of the, third, all the copies of the third edition and the author was to prepare a new edition. Well, Bell was not, a, well, Bell did that, you know, he had sold that, but generally what he did was he cut out the title page of the third edition of the of the third edition and printed a new title page and taped that in and gave it back to the uh, original purchaser or sold it on. So this just kept going. And finally, in early 1798, Simon Fisher, the this uh, young printer and circulating library owner decided to capitalize it. And he printed uh, The Castle of Lindenburg or The History of Raymond and Agnes. He's of course capitalizing on the, the ballet first and foremost because that is what is in the public interest as well as this overarching story about the monk. But this is the first time we have a specific novel being redacted for this purpose. And basically he, he stripped away some of the uh, juicy bits about the uh, about ambrosio and he stuck with raymond and agnes tale and the bleeding nun which is horrific in itself and sensational he reduced the three volume novel to 148 pages i mean he's he's cutting and, and pasting and changing a few words but it gets down to 148 pages the next year 1799 it's down to 98 pages and then by 1820 you can have a an entire re redacted version of this at 28 pages, which has the exact same plots, just a lot less words. So this was extremely popular um, at the time because it gave people who normally couldn't have access to the monk access to some of the story. And he published two illustrations with this in October of uh, 1797. So the, the book, this, this pamphlet probably appeared late December, early January. And was uh, quite well received. And uh, Simon Fisher, along with his collaborator in this, um, Thomas Hurst, decided that they had stumbled onto something that could be quite potentially um, good for their bottom line. So let me tell you a little about Simon Fisher. He had his circulating library and printing shop at number 10 St. John's Lane. Um, this is a picture 
uh, in the late 19th century of St. John's Gate. And his library would have been just down south from the first circle under 10 right there at the corner of St. John's Lane and George Court. And you can, the, the, the building itself was destroyed in World War II. Uh, building is on it, but the rows remain the exact same. So we have an idea of where this circulating library was. And it was a large commercial uh, building with, with windows and he had his, his uh, library there. Uh, from 1797 to about 1800, when he stopped, he closed the library and just focused on publishing and printing. Now, right away, Fisher figured out that he had stumbled onto something that was going to make him some money. And so he capitalized on this uh, commercial success. He issued four new Gothic pamphlets um, with Thomas Hearst the following year in 1799. The pair updated and expanded George Nicholson's edition of romances into Gothic stories. Uh, and this is the, the, the title page of that. And what's interesting particularly is that, remember that Sir Bertrand's is a fragment and a well-known fragment, but to capitalize on this you know, idea of, of uh, printing things from the, lib from the magazines and contributing original tales, he had a, he, or perhaps him or a, a writer that he hired finished the fragment and it ends with a marriage and is then packaged as Sir Bertrand's Adventures in a Ruinous Castle. And so then he chose other uh, short tales from that were appearing in mostly in the monthly visitor, the, uh, what is it, the monthly cabinet, those two journals, those two periodicals, uh, and he extracted those and then printed them up. And he found that this was, you know, quite the successful. He, uh, um, the pair of Fisher and Hearst published at least 13 Gothic titles between 1797 and 1802, including the castles of Montreux and Bar on the left there, and as well as uh, the adaptation of the Black Castle, it was, um, which was appearing, which was an adaptation of a drama based on um, a, a drama that was appearing at the Royal Circus. And it was by C.F. Barrett, which was, we think is, is Charlotte Frances Barrett, though maybe questionable. But she redacted a number of, uh, or, or uh, yeah, adapted a number of dramas from the Royal Circus or Astley's uh, Amphitheater, same place, for Fisher. And so it appears that he knew that he could take these melodramas and turn them into um, a wonderful story and sell them. So he continued at this location at St. John's until 1823 when he moved to um, 151 St. John's uh, Street, rather than, than Lane, where he issued his uh, Fisher's Library of Amusement, which contained reprints of Gothic novels by Anne Radcliffe, all of hers, and redactions of them. So as I showed before, there was a, uh, let's see if I can, okay. Sorry to go through that, but I think it's, okay, so, Here's the uh, uh, Fisher's uh, redaction and abridgment of the Castle of Athlone and Dunblane. And he did a whole series of these, of these, of Radcliffe's books and, and, and um, Eliza Parsons' Mysterious Warnings. He did this, uh, uh, Isabella Kelly's The Ruins of, Avondale, of Avondale Abbey um, and The Silver Lock by Isaac Crookedon. He, so even in 1823, Fisher saw a potential for readers to be interested in, in Gothic abridgments of old, now popular Gothic chapbooks. So I think that's kind of an interesting thing. And I'm sorry about going through this like this, but it's just gonna happen that way. Um, okay, so the other key figure in the development here in, the, in, these, in these first Gothic chapbooks is Thomas Hurst. At the time, of, in 1797, he was partnered with John Lee at number 32, Patronaster Row. And he had the more 
elegant address. He had one that was in the center of the heart of the book buying business. And so Fisher, by collaborating with him, had the opportunity to get his wares to circulate in libraries and to people who he normally wouldn't have. And Thomas Hearst was also fortunate to have a large country connection. So he had a network of, of booksellers in the country that he marketed his books through or sold his books through. So for Fisher, this was a great connection. And if you look on Patronastero, there is um, Thomas Fisher's shop, number 32. And across the street is the shop of, of Longman, the, bookseller, the booksellers who were, were quite famous and who eventually Hearst would join in around 1804. Hearst had, uh, his business had been growing and he was doing well and he decided that he needed a new uh, Clark and it happened to be one that was working at Longman's and Longman didn't want to lose this uh, This fellow named Orm and so he took both Orm and Hearst as partners and closing that means uh, Hearst closed his store, but it provided a more country uh, Network for Longman. So it, it helped both but he was the first one to successfully collaborate with other publishers besides Fisher on Gothic chapbooks. He um, went on to collaborate with uh, the publisher Arthur Neal, Anne Lemoyne, Thomas Tegg. In fact, he collaborated on 54 of the 89 Gothic titles published between 1798 and 1803. So he was, you know, he had his fingers in, in a lot of pies at this point. And he was, you know, he had found something that was really working. He was also at the time publishing Gothic novels at his own store. He did, he published uh, Francis Mary Mills, The Castle of Villery, and George Walker's The Three Spaniards in 1800. He later then had that novel adapt, uh, redacted and adapted into um, the Gothic pamphlet Don Alagona, The Sorceress of Montillo, which appeared in Marvelous Magazine. So he knew how to really market his, his, his uh, wares. And he was an ambitious publisher. And so he decided that it was time for him to open up his own magazine. Um, these are some of the, his collaborations um, with Lemoyne and, and uh, particularly then Hearst, which we will see. But he eventually turned his attention to Radcliffe's new, po uh, new novelist pocket magazine, which was edited by none other than Miss Marianne Radcliffe. Of course, you know, the, the, the choosing of her was, you know, of the, of the one-handed monk fame, that Marianne Radcliffe. And it was a conscious choosing, of course, uh, and marketing scheme, but it, it worked well for him to, to a point. The, this particular magazine, which was uh, advertised as a new and original magazine devoted to entertainment. Um, he claimed would offer uh, or contain elegant and chaste collection of original novels, tales, romances, lives, memoirs, voyages, travels together with a judicious selection from writing of those authors who are, uh, excite public notoriety. So anything sensational is basically he says. Uh, his first uh, edition of this, his first chapbook of this was The Adventures of Captain Duncan in a Journey from Europe, which is not very gothic -y or very interesting, but it was very popular. And he followed that up the next month with The Monkish Mysteries written by uh, Marianne Radcliffe or The Miraculous Escape, priced at a mere sixpence. And so he started seeing these opportunities and with a magazine, which we'll see when we get to the um, Marvelous magazine, these were designed to allow subscribers, you just subscribe to the magazine and get one each month. And then at the end, have them, you bring them in and either have them bound in a volume or you wait till the end of the six months and bind them all into one volume and then it's sent to you. So he gave uh, readers different options here. And it also demonstrates that these were not particularly, they may be sixpence um, and rather cheap, but their audience was not just the poor, poor working class. They were for the collectors. All right, 
Importantly, though, we need to discuss so quickly about the business of Chapbooks, because this is one thing that really interested me is that how did it all work? How did they raise their money? How did they advertise? How did they distribute? You know, by this time, we know the Chapmen were not traveling around the countryside um, selling their wares. So how did they do this? Um, and we can find a lot of information actually about this through the publication of the Castle of Lindbergh. Of, of Lindenberg because it gives us a, a, a good insight into how publishers worked together. Um, the relationship of a publisher and a bookseller is very close. And at the heart of it is the financial risk that is taken by either the publisher or the bookseller to um, invest in a potential title. The money was put up front, and so you had to prepay for the marketing, for the supplies, for the printing, for the distribution. And then after that, you made your money. And so it was a risky business. So Simon Fisher decided to take uh, a chance and to collaborate with Thomas Hearst to offset this. A collaboration between two publishers, though, um, is not a partnership. It's a sharing of capital, labor, warehousing sometimes, which resulted in the reduction of both production and the distribution times. Um, and it helped each other, but they were, they were limited in their collaborations um, because it all depended on you know, getting this thing out. So take, for example, the Castle of Lindenburg. Hearst had a better location. And so Fisher could, you know, either approached him or Hearst, vice versa, approached um, Hearst with this better location who could have access to a large uh, distribution network out to the country, but also a principal spot on the, the, the row, which was, you know, highly sought after for, for booksellers. And so he saw this as a as a positive. Now, the primary publisher is the one who, and the primary publisher can be a printer, a bookseller, a publisher, uh, the author, who assumes the, prime, uh, the principal financial risk. Therefore, his or her name was usually on the imprint, which was usually denoted by a printed uh, and sold by, or printed for, and other variations of that. When one or more firms though contributed to the financing of this particular title, they were known as first level associates and identified in the colophon as uh, designated by sold also. So take for example, this um, imprint or colophon. It, Hearst is the primary investor in this particular title. And this was uh, from the wandering spirit. And he had though financial support from from Jay Wallace, from Thomas Hughes, from Thomas Dean, from Mr. Richards, and uh, you know, Mr. Clark and Co. in Manchester, and uh, and as far as uh, Nottingham, and and oftentimes, eventually, you know, there were uh, Scottish Edinburgh uh, publishers who who are seen on these chapbooks. But these first level associates um, acted as retailers and distributors. So each investor would receive a certain number of copies of the pamphlet that they had invested in and would be able to sell those and make their money. So it is kind of an indication of uh, this shared risk initially. Now you see the primary publishers and the first associates really only through 1807. After 1807, the publishers either know that there's little risk or better reflects the lowering of, of printing costs because they are generally um, printed for, published by the primary author and then uh, available at all booksellers is how it's usually uh, appeared. So again, the public, the, the, once the pamphlets were given to the first level associates, they could further distribute those to circulating libraries, to uh, other stationers, other retailers, general stores that would offer them as well. So it was a multi-layered uh, process that could get these books out to 
to everyone. And I'm just going to go right into uh, Lemoyne, and then I'll get some questions and we'll pause. But out of all of this development, Anne Lemoyne is a very unique individual. Because not only is she a female uh, publisher, which is not rare actually within the Gothic chapbook industry, there were several uh, female publishers and printers who contributed quite a bit. Anne Kemish was a, 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 a printer and um, bookseller who printed novels and chapbooks for uh, John Kerr and his wife Anne Kerr and other um, chapbook publishers. And um, Susan Bailey, who we'll see later, uh, was very influential. She was a printer and a publisher and pushed uh, the female author very hard. So um, Lemoyne, though, is, is one of the most fascinating figures, due in large part to the fact that, good hell, she, she, she published 99 of the, of the 100, I mean, of the 400. So she's done this amazing um, feat of, of, of producing all of these books. Now, we know that she printed and published at least 400 uh, chapbooks of various, you know, from different tales, voyages, cookbooks, all of that. She published at least 400, and even of her 400, a quarter of them are, are Gothic tales. And then within the Gothic 400, yeah, she is the largest publisher to date. I mean, she's just, she outstripped everybody. She, um, we don't know a lot about her. We know she married Henry Lemoyne in January of 1786, and they set up a bookstore together. And in 1794, Henry and Anne uh, were engaged in a copper plate printing business. Unfortunately, it went bust, they lost everything, and Henry was uh, imprisoned for debt. And Anne left her husband and started her own uh, book, shop at number one White Rose Court, Coleman Street. And when Henry got released from prison, he became basically an itinerant bookseller, um, but he always kept involved with Anne Lemoyne. He actually printed several of her chapbooks, at least five of the chapbooks for her, and wrote a number of, of chapbooks as well. And this relationship with her ex-husband was very amicable until he died in, in uh, April of 1812. And not surprisingly, well, perhaps surprisingly, she closed her shop in 1812 and she married John Rowe, who she had formed a, a collaboration with uh, in 1797. And they retired to the wonderful place of Hackney. And uh, at the time, a little, more, a little more in the country, but it was still a, a nice escape for them. But Lemoyne is interesting because the way she created these chapbooks and the way she sold them and marketed them, because it's, she did it differently than almost every other publisher at the time. First of all, she established in 1796 a relationship with Thomas Maiden, who, was a, uh, copper who had a copper press and who would publish the majority of her works uh, the entire time. And they really started to increase how these books um, appeared. And this is just an indication of her, um, of her output peaking in 1805 and then the gradual decline. But these better chapbooks, um, which, I mean, if, when you look at the, the earlier ones, do appear a lot better, the illustrations are better, the printing itself is better. They, they, they stand out. And this is what made her uh, material different from other chapbook producers. And in 1797, she formed, as I said, a, a collaborative relationship with John Rowe. He had a shop at number 90 Houndsditch near Devonshire Square and the New Street East India Warehouse in the East End. And that opened up a whole new uh, customer base for her. But they joined together and their first publication actually was uh, Horace Walpole's The Mysterious Mother. 
and I think that's just you know a great way to start off your careers. Uh, your your collaboration is with something like like that. Um, her shift towards the Gothic, though, was obviously inspired by Hearst uh, and his involvement with the Castle of Lindenburg, because at the same time, in 1798, Lemoyne is starting a collaboration with Thomas Hearst. And so in 1799, she starts, uh, she issues her first Gothic chapbook, which is called Kilverstone Castle or the Era Sword, with Hearst as the first associate. Um, and she then goes on to produce, um, as we saw in the out, output here, a number of Gothic chapbooks every year. But consider how many, though, we don't exactly know because she didn't date all of her stuff, uh, how many a year of, of other types of chapbooks that she was printing. So this is just a, a portion of them, of that larger number. But it does show this, this increase from really 1801 up to 1807, where there was a, she, she purposely put out um, specifically Gothic chapbooks to her, to her customers. Um, she put out what we call a, a collection or anthology. And this is kind of an interesting term because we don't usually associate with, with Gothic chapbooks, but this is how she worked. And Edward Pitcher, uh, he's a, a literary historian. He's, he's fantastic. He does a lot of work on collections and anthologies. He wrote that, um, one of the, quote, one of the publisher's means of turning inexpensive fodder produced for the common reader into a modestly priced volume for a more general public. So they would take their, their collection of their chapbooks and they would put them together. The scheme required only the availability of a sufficient number of cheaper chapbooks and pamphlets belonging to one class, genre, uh, et cetera, which would lend some coherence. So the idea was that you would gather tales of a certain type together into a collection, into an anthology. And these collections or series were pre-planned, usually. Lemoyne knew exactly what she was planning, which uh, books would be included and when they would be published, how they would be published, if they would be push, published individually and then collected into the series, or would they be collected or pu published and then just collected into the series and then distributed. So there was lots of ways that they could um, sell these sorts of, of tales. Anne Lemoyne with Hearst as the first associate started their, their collaboration with a series called The English Knight's Entertainment. And it consisted of histories, adventures um, by the most celebrated authors. And of course, that's not exactly true, but um, it, was, it, it made for a good sale. And the collection appeared in four volumes, each volume containing six separate tales for a total of 24 chapbooks. It appeared in 1802. Each tale was 48 pages long and each volume was 288 pages. Regardless if they had to fill up space, that's how they would do it, but it would all be the same. And this compilation or anthology proved to be one of her best marketing devices and offered access to a larger and more upscale book market. And again, uh, Edward Pitcher notes that a distinction must be made between these pamphlet anthologies and those anthology collections or individual volumes, which A, had been compiled in parts issued in strict continuing sequence, B, had been made up from parts which included sections in main uh, and remained incomplete in themselves, but which were completed only when the series, whole series was assembled, or C, ultimate distinction had been made up of parts which were finally compiled when reconstituted works, which the publisher had for the beginning intended. So there was lots of different ways to approach this. Um, and so we can, we can look at um, Lemoyne and see a few things. First, it's evident that she compiled these chapbook analogies from overruns. And overruns where you would do, where you would print a pamphlet for a, a specific number and give those out to the, to sell them and what you were left with, remainders. And these overruns were generally burned. They just tossed them onto the fire because it was cheaper to burn them 
and waste of paper than it was to store them. They just didn't have the space. But they decided that that's probably not the best. So um, what Lemoyne would do is she would organize them in advance, release the individual chapbooks, um, but identify them within a certain series. So if a series was going to be, um, when a series was announced, she already knew the chapbooks that would be included. So if a chapbook would be printed individually uh, with the title of the, the collection and in the collection itself. So you would know where it came from. So her, her second series um, was probably most famous, the Telltale of the Universal Museum. And this ended up being this uh, monster uh, collection. Um, depending on how you can find it broken up between five and six volumes. And each volume contained a number of, of tales, not all of them gothic and not all of them sensational. And it kind of underscores her general approach to this. These were not sold specifically to gothic readers. These were sold as general readers for everyone. And it had a little bit of everything in there. It had histories, it had biographies, it had sensational stories, it had um, poems, it had ballads, all of these things that were um, marketed together that could, you know, be of interest to larger, uh, to the larger audience. And it kind of shows that the, the idea that we have that there's a specific Gothic reader out there who's waiting for these may not be particularly true. Um, but it you know, gives us some indication of, of the, um, the interest that is happening because people would know that they could buy a specific, like the Welsh cottage chapbook from uh, Le Moyne. It's a very Gothic chapbook while at the same time, the history of John Gilpin, which is a well-known uh, pamphlet from the 18th century that was still being republished, but everybody had something that they liked. But the illustrations were all the same, well done. The quality is, is increasing better than, of course, these wood carvings. And this became something that was, that she would be well known for. Her next one was the popular tales, lives and adventures. And this was um, published in 1805 and 1806. And this one, at, at the same time, though, she also issued a the pocket navigator, which was a collection in four volumes of nautical themed chapbooks. Um, 24 of them priced at sixpence, while popular lives, uh, Tales, Lives, and Adventures was completed in 48 numbers at threepence each. So depending on the market, who the collection is marketed towards, she would charge a different price. So it's only threepence for the popular tales, but fourpence for the nautical based. So you have all of these different things that she's doing to try to reach a larger audience. Sarah Wilkinson, um, the chapbook author, makes her appearance with Lemoyne a lot. Um, and I included the, the Albert of Wernendorf because that's probably one of my favorite chapbooks by Wilkinson, which is an adaptation of an adaptation of, of Matthew Lewis's ballad. But um, it's also, um, you know, just a kind of a, a great, and I'm sorry, I, I'm terrible at photographing these things in the libraries. Um, apparently, I just cannot. This is the clearest of that particular uh, event with Albert being sucked down to hell. Um, so, but this is just kind of gives you an indication of what she is offering at the time. But beyond the collections, she would occasion she would print these chapbooks individually. So you could buy them individually. Something like the Castle of Alvadaro, which appeared in a later collection, and the Maid of Sicily, which appeared in popular tales, they could both be published, I mean, they could both be purchased within that larger collection, or if you were interested, you could gather a whole bunch of Gothic chapbooks and have them bound into one volume. And that's what a lot of people do. Actually, the, the popular tales uh, edition that I founded uh, at UCLA, they had five volumes 
and they had them broken up into not the order that they were supposed to be, but somebody had gone through and had decided which tales they did not like. And they had removed uh, four of the 48 and in this collection only included um, 44 of them. And so you could assemble the ones you wanted to and got rid of the ones, the other tales that you weren't interested in when you had them bound into a larger volume. But for the other uh, consumers, you could buy these individually. And if you notice the one on the left, it's priced at fourpence, which is a little more. The one on the right, the made of Sicily, even though it's colored, it's at threepence. So at this time, even the, the extra cost of coloring a, 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 an illustration wasn't adding too much into the cost of the book itself. So one last thing to mention is that she also did a collection called The Wild Roses. And that's a fun one because it's two volumes, six chapbooks each. Um, and one, was, one volume was published in 1806, the other in 1807. And they were all Gothic except one, which was, uh, I think, The Hat Maker of Baghdad. Uh, not sure why that was included with all of these other wonderful, and I don't even know if I included now, the wonderful uh, uh, titles, but um, it was marketed not as with some sensational title, but as Wild Roses or Cottage Tales. And so you know, I, I'm still trying to figure out how and why they use certain terms, but Wild Roses was one of her best-selling series, completely gothic, but you wouldn't tell that from the title. So, and almost all of, of, of Lemoyne's chapbooks did appear in um, collections. Only 18 of the 99 did not appear in any of the collections, but were just individual, meaning that she may have published those for an author, particularly uh, Sarah Wilkinson's The Subterraneous Passage, for example, was published just as the chapbook and not in anything at the same time that she's publishing tales in the Telltale magazine. So it just depended on, on uh, the author's motive or perhaps it was Lemoyne's idea that not all books, uh, not all pamphlets would sell that well. So I'm going to stop here for a moment before we're going to tag and take a break. And if you have any questions, let me know. Sorry. Well, we're going to talk now about Thomas Tegg because Thomas Tegg's really, you know, he, he is a well-known figure, much despised, like I said, amongst other publishers, because he was open and very <laughs> confident about making money by plagiarizing other people. You know, I mean, he was, he was, he was very much for that and, and uh, people hated him, but you know what? He got these books out to people and they had access. So he's worth remembering. So Thomas Tegg originally had, like I showed you with uh, Simon Fisher, he's just down the street, number 122 St. John's Street. Uh, there's the picture of his uh, establishment, Tegg and Castleman, uh, the eccentric book warehouse. And I, I love that title and it does, you know, kind of typify him. And he, you know, this was on a coaching road. So it was, it was, frequented and he was able to make a lot of money from this. At the same time that he is operating this store though, he is out in the country holding daily auctions, traveling with his wife. So he left his business with the Mr. Castleman, which we do not know anything about because Teg didn't really say anything about him in his memoir, um, except that he partnered with him. So Tegg's life's worth remembering. He was born in 1776 in March in Wimbledon. He was, uh, his father was a successful grocer, but died. His mother died. He was sent to boarding school, had a terrible time, became an apprentice to somebody who was abusive. He ran away to London and in 1796, he began working in different uh, print shops. He even worked in uh, with William Lane at Minerva Press. And then in 1799, he received 200 pounds uh, legacy and opened his first shop with Joseph Dalton DeWick, which ended in catastrophe. They, uh, I mean, 
within, it looks like within a, a year, less than a year, they had lost all their money and the partnership was dissolved and Teg was bankrupt. And that's when he started going on his um, daily trips to the countryside and his book auctions. He was very famous for those things. Um, but he finally came back to London and in 1801, he he established the eccentric book warehouse with Teg, I mean, with Castleman. And while Teg traveled the country, Castleman ran the shop and it was successful. Ta Castleman appears retired in 1804 and he, uh, Teg closed the shop there, opened up one at 111 Cheapside and then moved to 73 Cheapside. The uh, former residence of the Lord Mayor uh, Lord Mayor's house called the Old Mansion House, where he lived until 1845 when he died. And um, at that end of that wonderful career. But Tag had a short and intense relationship with the Gothic. I mean, it is, when you get down to it, it was really intense. It began in 1802, ended in 1804, briefly resurrected in 1810. A couple of his books were no date, have no, are, are not dated, so we don't know precise, but it is um, a, uh, uh, we can generally see what he is doing here with his, his, his story, I mean, with his publishing. He's mostly well known for his connection to the Marvelous Magazine. The Marvelous Magazine was actually, though, not started by Teg, nor was it started by Hearst, who he collaborated with on this. Um, it was building off the design that was initiated by Anne Lemoyne for a series of, uh, for a magazine series where subscribers would pay a, a shilling a month for a new publication, 72 pages um, with uh, beautiful crafted illustration. The paper was a fine quality and for a shilling a month, the subscriber would obtain this. And at the end, it would the each copy would be bound into a single volume. And this was actually started by a man named uh, Gilbert who advertised this scheme in the newspapers. And he was as, and uh, Gilbert had as his first associate, um, this publisher, uh, Benjamin Cosby, who ended up doing a lot of stuff with Gothic chapbooks as well and Gothic novels. Um, but Gilbert put out the first um, issue of this uh, magazine and then uh, disappeared from view. And Thomas Hurst swept in and took over management but he didn't want to assume all of the responsibility. So he took on Tag as, a, as a, another principal publisher. And so he really starts out as somebody who's helping Tag or helping Hearst with uh, saving this in, in endeavor. And I, I'm right. Okay, so it's interesting because these were also, um, advertised. So they were advertised in the newspaper because they were looking for subscribers. They were looking for people who, customers who would be willing to put out money before they received it. Knowing Tag, knowing Hearst, and knowing their quality of their productions, they were confident that they could do this. So the, the advertisement on the left is by Hearst. And it tells us a lot of information that isn't uh, that that helps us understand a little bit more about how this was the project was put together and what they were offering and what these subscribers were trying were actually getting. So, elegantly printed fine woven paper embellished with seven highly finished engravings. This is the whole volume when it's done. Um, with engravings by Rose and original designs by Craig um, for the year 1802, and so for the volume it was six shillings. Um, and a sixpence neatly done up with boards containing one to six. And so they would continually advertise this for each of the volumes and monthly they would, uh, weekly, I mean monthly, sorry, they would also advertise the forthcoming um, tale. 
but I love how they, they, they advertise this. So we know that the majority of these, these Gothic chapbooks, I mean, the chapbooks were Gothic. Most of them were adaptations of famous Gothic works. Um, but if you notice uh, uh, how the Marvelous Magazine is being sold, it says it's being a curious and entertaining collection of original tales, histories, memoirs, travels, and highly interesting and suited to a very general and extensive reading. So again, they're trying to reach everybody out there. Um, it's a general readership, but there are no original. <laughs> There are very few original tales, um, histories, memoirs, travels in this entire collection. And they had already, you know, any of the subscribers already knew that, but they still continued to, to support this because it just got bigger and bigger. They had more and more support. Um, and this advertisement by Hearst, he points out that he, it, this, this may be had by Jay Dingle in Barry. And then he gives a list of other um, booksellers or first associates who contributed to the selling or to the financing of this project. And he also plugs in, of course, his own um, Radcliffe's new novelist magazine, which ended after number two because it wasn't you know, that great. But um, in each one of those booksellers would have booksellers underneath them that they supplied copies of these ch chapbooks to as well. So if the Midnight Assassin appeared first, and it, it, that was the first one, so both Hearst and Ted took their share, then they sent the remainders out to the first associates who um, contributed to the financing. And those, pub those booksellers like Dingle would give them to smaller bookstores, would sell them to smaller bookstores to sell, or they would um, advertise that they could ask for, through any bookseller, they could ask for this particular volume, this particular chapbook, and they would just write to the publisher like Dingle or Hearst, and they would send out one. So there's different ways you could get them and uh, different ways you could uh, market them. So the, the advertisement on the right is by Teg. And he's still going over, you know, he's, he again is, is talking about the, the qualities of this and the fact that it's going to, uh, you know, contain accounts of lives, history, travels, blah, 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 all the things that are really not in there. But again, advertising it to a very general readership. He wants not just to collect those people who want and like the sensational Gothic, but for everybody. And he puts that he then is, is printed for tech because each publisher would publish it as their own. So there are the Midnight Assassins that say published by Hearst, there are Midnight Assassins that, assassins that say published by Tag, And each are legit and each then are found in different collections. Um, one thing to note though with the Tag advertisement, after Hearst left, he took, uh, Tag took um, another investor, Thomas Brown in um, Edinburgh as a, as a principal publisher. And Teg though is, is advertising throughout the realm this, this series, but he wants to make sure that, he's, that his readers and his subscribers buy his version, not necessarily um, the other versions. The, from, from, from the publisher. And so he notes in the very bottom of the one on the right that when you do, you ask for the, the copy from our, you know, from the Marvelous magazine that are covered in our patent yellow paper. So going back to the idea that we call these things blue books. Well, the blue books were not necessarily blue. They were blue, they were yellow, they were green, all sorts of colors. In fact, Teg preferred his chapbooks in yellow paper. But that was just another way to, sure, I'm, I have all these people who are working, you know, who are, who are selling the same book, but I want you to buy my version of it individually. So look for that yellow paper. And it's just one of those things tacked onto the bottom. Hearst doesn't do that sort of thing. He's just kind of lets them, you know, he figures a sale is a sale, really. So, um, so, the Marvelous Magazine proved a tremendous success. We had upwards of, 
of 30 first associates in that, that would buy into this and contribute into it um, and would um, make money off of this. So clearly all the way through 1805, 1806, there was still a sustained interest in these Gothic chapbooks. There was an audience that appealed to, and it was a general readership audience though. I mean, I think there were those who really preferred the stuff from like William Lane, Seminar of a Press and, and things like that, or, or uh, J.F. Hughes' Sensational Gothic. But readers as a whole like to have access to general information and uh, they did make money though off of the more sensational. So after though the Marvelous Magazine ended, Ted went away from the Gothic. He turned his back and he started other things. Actually, what he, funny thing he started, he started getting into caricatures and he started caricature magazines with uh, the caricaturist Thomas Rowland, uh, Rowlandson. He, um, for several years, sold um, caricatures and marketed his eccentric book warehouse as the, as, as a caricature warehouse where you could get finally get caricatures that are reasonably priced. So he did the exact same thing that he did with the Gothic uh, chapbooks as he did with, with caricatures. But in 1810, he saw renewed interest and he set out and he put out what he called, because he was always encouraged to use his own name um, as, as an advertising tool, Tegg's Edition. And so he, he republished uh, several adaptations, including Mary Robinson's Vicenza from 1792, uh, Charlotte Dockra's uh, Zofloya the Moor, he renamed uh, The Demon of Venice, an original romance. And that one, I will say, is probably one of the rare occasions where somebody took an adaptation, a clear adaptation of another book, and tried to pass it off as an original romance. Um, other than that, most people clearly understood <laughs> where it was from. He also published uh, Julia Outen's The Iron Chest uh, that same year. And this was an adaptation of George Coleman Younger's play, The Iron Chest, which itself was an adaptation of William Godwin's Adventures of Caleb Williams. So again, it's intriguing to me that you are, they are adapting adaptations of books and plays that are a lot older and they're still finding a market for them because these are the type of publishers who do not publish things that people do not want. They know what people want. They know what is going to, to sell. And so this resurgence though um, with the Gothic pamphlet in, in uh, 1810, 22 appeared in 20 new Gothic chapbooks appeared in 1810 with six of them being uh, tags. But after that, he left the industry, um, the Gothic pamphlet industry and turned his attention to caricatures and cheap editions of, of books, which leads us then to the decline. So after 1810, we kind of see this, general decline in the interest of the chapbooks and in the publishing, though we still had a number of publishers involved. And I think one of the most interesting stories about the Gothic chapbook has to do with the Baileys. And the Baileys are what I would call the Gothic family. They, they are the quintessential Gothic publishers because they had their hands in everything and um, they lasted for a long time. So it all began with, oh, and they uh, up here on 33, uh, 32 Threadneedle Street, the, uh, um, was the office of what was uh, Susan Bailey and then became Dean and Monday. So Susan Bailey became, or Susan Bailey was, um, the wife of William Bailey, a printer, who was a very successful printer. And they had four kids, John Norton, Anna Maria, Anne, uh, Mary Ann, and Thomas, who 
they really don't ever talk about. Um, but when William died in 1794, he left his entire firm to his wife, Susan. So she began printing things under the imprint uh, S. Bailey, which you can see up there on the, on the uh, slide. Uh, and she, she was at, at the time, number 50, Bishop's Gate Within. And she published at least five Gothic chapbooks um, between 1799 and 1810. Uh, two by Sarah Wilkinson and one by Lucy Watkins. Uh, I think, interestingly, four of those chapbooks all featured the title Castle in it. It was as if she's not very, you know, she knew what she liked and she wanted castles. So she published Glenavon Castle, uh, Romano Castle, the Castle of Montebino, and the Castle of Oroville. And so uh, she pushed the female authors. She supported, she helped out with Sarah Wilkinson. Sarah Wilkinson had been writing novels for several years. And then in 1809, um, J.F. Hughes went bankrupt. And she didn't have any more work. And so she returned briefly to writing uh, Gothic chapbooks. And she published these with, generally with Susan Bailey. Until the next year, uh, Hughes came back and she again stopped uh, publishing chapbooks temporarily. But um, in February of 1810, Susan Bailey died. And in her will, she transferred ownership and control of the firm, the Bailey firm, to, um, and I'll read it, to her two daughters. And the, the will is fascinating because it says, quote, the whole of my business um, would be for their own sole use and benefit, absolutely not to be subject of control of any present or future husband. And so the firm was passed firmly into the daughter's hands. And we'll see where that takes us. But her son, John Bailey, had left the family business in 1799 and with his mother's help had established himself as a printer and publisher. And he had a large stock of, of pamphlets that he offered. And it was generally historical adventures, tales of bandits, romance and sentimental tales, popular dramas, reprints of standard popular works, um, six penny chapbooks with current affairs, political scandals, sensational trials, all sorts of things from cooking to fishing to swimming, boxing, and um, even firework making, he offered these things. And you know he had a very successful business going. Bailey, John Bailey published at least 38 chapbooks of the 400 and about almost 10% of the, of the uh, amount. And he basically operated through 1808 to 1823 publishing these things. 11 of the titles that he published were redactions, including adaptations of novels by Sir Walter Scott. He published um, the adaptations of Rob Roy, The Heart of Midlothian, uh, Ivanhoe, and The Monastery. Sarah Wilkinson wrote six titles for Bailey, and four of which were adaptations. Some of them were the, the, um, the uh, Scott adaptations. She also wrote The Welsh Heiress, the illustration on the left. And I just included the frontispiece on the right because that's just fantastic. You know, it's just, it's just a fun um, example of the kinds of frontispieces he would include in his chapbooks. Um, Bailey's selection, though, underscores his determination, like all of the publishers, to appeal to the general reader. Adaptations of popular novels and dramas were financially sound, so he did invest in those. He published um, the pamphlet, The Ruffian Boy, The Castle of Waldemar, which was it, the title said, founded on the interesting and popular melodrama performing at the Surrey Theater, taken from Mrs. Opie's celebrated tale of that name. So he is capitalizing on the success of the play, which is capitalizing on the success of the uh, tale by Mrs. Opie, 
And so again, they love this sort of, of adaptations of adaptations. He also published the uh, Wolfstein or the Mysterious Bandit from the Schilling Shocker slide, um, and which is an adaptation of Percy Shelley's uh, Saint Irvine of the Rosicrucian. And he included in the back of that the, a strange little tale called uh, the bronze statue which had just appeared in the european magazine in may of the same year so he stuffed that in there and like bailey like his mother he also printed um the affecting history of the duchess of c dot 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 who was confined in nine years in a horror dungeon that tale by uh by madame de glane de glane was reprinted almost by every single publisher of gothic chapbooks um, it was just a standard work. You could, it was, an, it was old enough that you could publish it outright, maybe change a name or, a, you know, do something, but that one was always published because it had an audience. Um, all of his chapbooks were offered at the same price of the sixpence. Colored and all, so again, the price is coming down on paper and il the illustrations are getting better. And with one exception, he published the castle of another version of Castle of Lindenberg or the history of Raymond and Agnes, uh, this time by Sarah Wilkinson, which he charged a shilling for. So he knew that it was uh, twice as long. It was a 60 page uh, chapbook compared to the usual 24 to 48 pages. So he knew that uh, it was a little more profitable. One thing to note about Bailey and with Dean and Monday and some of the other chapbook publishers. Around this period, they started to uh, employ George and Robert Cruikshank as illustrators. They're the famous illustrators and characterists, um, and even Thomas Rowlandson to illustrate these chapbooks. So they did a whole lot of, of Gothic chapbooks. Um, you can find their signatures in the books. And a great way, if you're looking for obscure chapbooks, um, look in the catalogs of Robert and George Cruikshanks because they actually have a great list of their illustrations and where they appeared and when. So that's a, that's a good thing to be able to find. He also um, published a, at least four pamphlets about Dr. Faustus. And um, again, Cruikshank, uh, George Cruikshank illustrated all four of them, but with different points of view and they were really quite interesting. Um, one last thing we need to say about him though, is that he didn't use dates. And this is, you know, this is a problem with at least a third of the books that were published. I mean, the chapbooks that were published, um, at least a third did not have any dates included. We can make assumptions based on the, when uh, they were operating and when a certain play or a novel came out, because a lot of them would say based on the, a play that is currently here. So we know that when it was published, but a large portion of Bailey's 38, uh, um, 38 of his chapbooks are undated. No, no, sorry five are dated of the 38. So 33 of them were not dated. So we know that they were sometime between 1812 and 1823, but we don't know for sure. So the, going back to the graphs, it does, that, that is always one of my factors of, of, of production. We don't know exactly when those other thirds, though generally they, they turn, tended to be later in the, um, period after 1810, but not significant enough to change um, those, uh, those numbers in any big direction. All right, so as I said about Susan Bailey, then her son, John Bailey, her two daughters though, happened to marry Susan Bailey's own apprentices. So uh, Marianne married uh, Thomas Dean and Anna Maria married William Mundy. And so when their mother died, they took over the business at 35 Threadneedle Street. They all moved in together. They all had dozens of kids and lived above the shop as these two families 
till at least 1838 when the partnership was dissolved and they went off to different places to retire. Thought that they didn't have a falling out, but they just, you know, after, you know, living together and working together for all these years, they finally had enough and, 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 and left. But even during the time they changed their names to Dean and Mundy, uh, the daughters were in control of the firm. They still had that right according to the will of, of Susan Bailey. Uh, Dean and Monday, though, is important because they became the leading books uh, producer of, uh, the leading producer of children's books. They were renowned throughout the 19th century and into the 20th century for their, their movable children's books. And so their origins, though, of you know, are, are squarely in the Gothic because after they were formed in 1810, they published at least 33 Gothic pamphlets and worked extensively with Sarah Wilkinson, publishing other things, um, other Gothic uh, pamphlets, and just generally being a force in the industry as the thing kind of petered out. Um, they began, though, by publishing their mother's stock of Gothic chapbooks. Their, one of their first chapbooks was the Castle of Montebino, which you see up there is the, has the cover printed by Susan Bailey, but inside they reprinted it and had their own imprint, Dean and Monday, on it. And they did this with a lot of, of, of uh, Susan Bailey's stock. They would just cut off the title page or they would cover it with their own own own, own uh, covers or reprint the title page and they you know not to lose money but a new name and new opportunities afforded them so they also continued to publish Sarah Wilkinson and Lucy Watkins and I do think we're really concerned about Wilkinson's uh, life as she, as the industry, Gothic pamphlet industry started to decline, they worked with her. And in fact, in 1823, they assumed um, control of the Ladies Monthly Museum. In 1816, actually, they, they, they bought out or worked, began to be the publishers of the Ladies Monthly Museum. And they, um, hired Sarah Wilkinson to run a section of that magazine where she earned, I can't remember the price, it was pittance of course, but it provided her with sustenance all the way to 1828 when they sold it. And that, you know, Sarah Wilkinson lost her only steady income that she ever had had. And within a year, year and a half, she was in a workhouse. Um, because of the downturn in the Gothic chapbook industry and in the closure of the Ladies Monthly Museum. But the, Dean and Monday were very important because they continued to produce Gothic chapbooks throughout the 1820s. They diversified and started to, like John, John also turned his attention to children's books. He started, um, and he actually published several of Sarah Wilkinson's um, ABC books. And she's very proud of this in, in the letters to the Royal Literary Fund. She makes a point that, that uh, she sold a series of children's books to John Bailey for copyright and that um, they are in demand with the parents of the pupils that she taught in, in, uh, in the national school where she briefly served. So they continue to work with her throughout and Sarah Wilkinson would go on to do several adaptations. Um, she did The Pirate, Sisters of Borough Westra, um, A Tale of the Islands of Shetland and Orkney, epitomized by Sarah Wilkinson. Again, she was very, always pretty clear about where she got the material. And I do think that she was asked by the publishers to adapt certain books and, and certain uh, dramas that she was good enough at that, that she really um, 
she was effective and, and somebody that they could rely on. So again, Dean and Monday, like, like John Bailey, had a, were not great about putting their dates on. We know that uh, the pamphlets dated between 1810 and 1828, um, at least 28, 23 of those were undated. And which caused a problem. 14 of those were published anonymously, and Sarah Wilkinson uh, penned at least nine of those. So she was um, actively involved, but as time went by and Dean and Monday, Bailey, and other publishers of the Gothic chapbook that I can't mention, I think people like uh, William Mason and, and, uh, and Hodges, Hodgson and co, they continued to, to produce these Gothic chapbooks, but they became fewer and fewer as each of these publishers turned to the more lucrative child's book market. And in the end, we even see some of the Gothic chapbooks becoming children's books and being utilized not necessarily as tales of horror, but as tales of instructions with horror as a consequence. So you have one critic actually um, noting that Dean and Monday's collection of children's books was pretty, you know, the, the children's books were pretty uh, uh, horrific in, in punishments. And that he, he speculated that a lot of this was that um, Dean and Monday, you know, prided themselves in, in uh, sensational fiction before they turned to children's books and that they just retained that language and that it still worked for for children you know the threat of the devil showing up and dragging you to hell is 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 good motivation for some so by 18 i'd say 1825 we have a we have this brief resurgence with the endless entertainment collection which included the monster made by man which is the first adaptation of the drama which was an adaptation of Frankenstein. So we have that and there's another uh, fantastic adaptation in there of, uh, oh, of uh, The Three Brothers by Joshua Pickersgill from 1803. And another one by, uh, based on the Deformed Trans, uh, it's Deformed Transformed, which is based on Lord Byron, um, story about a, a dwarf. And so we, there was this resurgence, but after 1825, the production of Gothic chapbooks declined dramatically. And you can still find occasional ones after that, but the industry itself, they no longer focused on that. There was no publisher who really spent time and effort trying to produce these things. So that is, you know, it's a brief, and, and sorry, it's not more in depth, uh, overview of this of this industry, which we still do not know a lot about. And I, that's why I think it is important for us, you know, as Gothic scholars to look at all of these aspects to get a better understanding of the uh, entire range of Gothic and not just focus on the better written, of course, in novels. But these are just as fun and interesting as well. And I would encourage you to look at these as well. So I will, quit out of this and stop sharing. And if you have any questions, just let me know. Thank you very much. There is a question in the chat. 